Alina, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. For the second time. <laughs> <laughs> we recorded this once and I was like, this is too controversial. We'll try it again. And yeah, here we are. Try and tame it in. We will. Yeah. Um, so most women refer to you as the person that is setting the female race back generations. I know, I know. The anti feminist the submit to her husband awful woman from the handmaid's tale that wants all women trapped in their homes to look after children and do nothing else with their life that is how i found you though i saw a video that someone tagged me in and they're like it the the title was submits to her husband or something like that and i thought oh okay i'm gonna read this but everything you were saying made so much sense i was like i've got to talk to her so (laughs) Here we are. Well, yeah, and you were one of the kindest people to contact me actually, because the majority of them wanted to kill me. But yeah, you were oh, kind nice. that's not fun. No, not really. Um, well, that's a whole podcast episode for a whole other time. How you survive in a social media world that is <laughs> joyful. Yeah. Um, first of all, can you just explain what a trad wife is? Because this is how you've become famous. This is how you've gone viral. You've gone on this morning and radio shows. And what was the BBC one you did? Was it, what was the one you did on a Sunday that was like... Oh, the, the question, the big questions. Yes. You've, yeah. done, you've, you've gone all over the UK and internationally. I was like nationally, internationally. Can yeah. you tell us what a trad, trad, a trad wife is? Well, well, unfortunately, on a trad the term trad wife has kind of been hijacked by uh some really fundamental people who have got links to white supremacy and the alt-right and things like that which is just it's a case of the few spoiling it for the many but trad wife is just a conjunction of traditional housewife and i think the reason why it went viral was because no one's talking about being a traditional housewife anymore in terms of husband goes out makes a living woman stays home nurtures and you know looks after the home that's her business essentially it's not paid classically in terms of receiving a wage or anything like that it's literally a really traditional family model something that was really common pre kind of 1960s era um but now it's almost like we're just this like really quiet uh group of people who have no representation in the media whatsoever housewives in the media are really poorly represented as well so like think about the real housewives of wherever shows they're not even housewives I I think they don't even clean their own homes those women they just spend all their time shopping and going on girls holidays and you know it's not representative of a traditional housewife's role and then the ones that you do see in soap operas they're all miserable because that's all people are in soap operas isn't it they're all miserable so there's no like really positive representation in the media so that's what I kind of did I said hang on a minute there's loads of women that are at home taking on this role of looking after the home as if it's their business and their husband's earning the money um and we're really happy doing it and there are so many women that want to do it and don't feel like they can express that or step into that role for fear of uh, basically what I've experienced, people belittling me or making me feel like I'm stupid or um, like I'm at risk, like my husband's suddenly going to start abusing me or he's going to leave me for a younger woman. Or There's no trust in marriage anymore and there's no trust in the, in the kind of marriage dynamic whereby one person stays at home the only model for marriage these days is where both people work so and that's that really doesn't work out for families unfortunately in many cases because you know they're so stressed out and the babies you know have to go into childcare. obviously things are very expensive so lots of people do have to work but for those that women that don't want to work and do want to stay home what's holding them back from what I've found actually in terms of like all the emails and stuff I've had is that they're scared to do it for fear of what people will think of them more than anything. Mm. There's so much to what you just said from the whole marriage thing and childcare thing, but it, the first thing I'd love to talk to you more is this whole view of a housewife. Why has it become like that? It's like you're less of a person or you're just a housewife. It's always this just yeah just like if I sort of was to look at what a mum or a woman does all day it's the equivalent to 
about four or five different jobs, but because you're not being paid for it, it's like you're not living life to your full potential. That's sort of the message we're getting. And I remember I went to a girls' school and it was all like, you're going to go to university, you're going to have a career, you're going to do this, 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 and this. And there was absolutely no talk whatsoever about building a home or how to have a happy home. None of that, because it was like, this is just not relevant. We need to, you know, we need equality. I know. This is what I don't like about culture today is because we're raising people, not just women, but men too, to do nothing but work. Like there's no work-life balance anymore. There's no, like you say, there's no conversation about how to make a home. Um, If you think about curriculum, pre-1960s, again, they would have homemaking, home economics classes so that when these people were setting up home, they knew what to do. They knew how to manage a household. And they were also learning it at the feet of their mothers and fathers because that's just what you did. Whereas now with everyone out to work, hiring in a cleaner for example no one's going to learn these life skills you know they're not going to learn them at school they're not going to learn them at home and then suddenly no wonder these women who kind of attack the idea of a trad worker there's nothing more boring or horrific than doing housework but it's actually it can be quite enjoyable when you learn to master it when you know how to manage yourself essentially it's like training for any role so it's just yeah we we are so consumed by job title status how much money we have um what we do rather than how we live Mm. do you find yourself getting bored ever because that's that's what a lot of people are concerned about that they would be at home and they would be bored because there's nothing to do at home what do you do there's so i I know what you do but yeah there's so well I do extra things actually I write as well I've written two books so I can do that in my spare time and that was a dream I always had you know like there's so many women especially in my community who do things outside of the traditional housewife role you know they might write they might paint they they've got hobbies you know like if you've got a hobby you're never going to be bored because you'll always have something to do so for me it centers around writing and reading I just love doing that so And thankfully I can create the time and space to do that because I'm at home and I can manage it well. I'm not rushing about, I'm not coming home from the nine to five, trying to squeeze in the housework until 8 p.m. and then I'm utterly exhausted. I recognize that that's a really privileged position to be in, but it would be remiss of me to sit there and say, my husband's out at work all day earning money and I'm just at home I'm really bored you know it's like it's a really ungrateful kind of attitude to have no one's going to pull you out of that but yourself so I don't see how you could be bored when you know there are so many opportunities Mm. there are so many opportunities it's not just about the housework I think that's another thing that people get really um het up about is they think that I am literally just a cleaner from you know dusk till dawn till dusk you know, like I do other things as well. I go out, I see friends, I take my son, I homeschool my son. So we do stuff together, you know, like it's constant go, 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 go. And for, for mothers particularly, before their children were of school age, remember how full your days used to be. You know, like that doesn't change just suddenly, you know, because your child's at school and you're at home all day on your own or something. There's always something to do. So I think that's just a bit of a, it's like fake news that housewives are bored. But also there's this idea that you're being suppressed. Do you feel suppressed? What, when my husband has to sit in an office on his bubble day doing the work to earn the money <laughs> and I can go and do what I like in a day? Yeah, that's really oppressive. I love how you put that. It's so true. It does... It's so true. He's the slave to the man and I'm not. People think that I'm a slave to him, but I'm really not. You know, I'm going to eat three times a day. I'm going to just put out an extra plate for him. Do you know what I mean? Like it's not this sense of like real slavedom. And I think this is the problem with people understand, like misunderstanding the, you know, kind of like interpreting submission in a, in a bad way. It just basically means because my husband's the breadwinner, he knows the inner workings of our financial details and the larger aspects of running the home. So if he says to me something like, um, love, we can't, uh do this this month because we've got you know we've got to replace the windows or something you know i'm like okay because i trust that he's got it all in hand do you know what i mean it's not Mm. kind of like i want you up at six o'clock to mop the floors 
Like I manage <laughs> my own day and my yeah. own life. I just trust him with the larger details. And also it's a marriage thing in the fact that we see, a friend said this to me once, we see each other's blind spots. So if I've got, if there's something going on in my life where I might be leading myself into something that perhaps isn't good for me, so a particular friendship, you know, when you get friends or you meet people and you think, oh, they're okay, you know, they're, they're fine, but someone else goes, oh, I'm not sure about how they're treating you. Someone from the outside observes something. Mm. They see your blind spot. So him saying to me, I really don't think this is healthy. Step back from it. I'll go, right, okay, right thanks for taking care of me and looking after me and seeing that. And I know you know what's best for me. We do it in reverse as well. It's not just him in charge the whole time, but we're just this one kind of unit working together. And I think people think that the submission thing is literally, some people think it's a weird sexual thing. Like well, that's, that is, I have to be honest. I mean, I have a filthy mind, but I feel like that's the first thing that comes to mind. Like, it just sounds like yeah. some sort of bondage. I know, 50 shades of grey kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. So that's a, I'll ask you about that another time. But, yeah, um, <laughs> but you know what? Let's romanticise it a little bit. It's more like a, a white knight on a horse. Mm. Like we'll romanticize it rather than kind of sexualize it. You know, he's, he's my knight in shining armor. He steps Aww. in and protects me, you know, not my Christian gray with weird stuff. <laughs> you have the knight. I'll take Christian gray. <laughs> yeah. I'll take his um, money. <laughs> but this is, I, I mean, I do, what you say does make a lot of sense because I see this a lot where we're pushed to be equal like men. We're pushed to go out to work but there was something, what was it I saw? There was a quote that said, two incomes, no sex. And I often relate it to this idea that if you were running a business, you wouldn't put everyone in the finance department. Exactly. Yeah. You would split things up. People would be responsible for different areas and then There's you would help each other. Yeah, exactly. And you would all come together. And actually the idea of a woman being at home and cooking and nurturing and yeah, building a home is quite beautiful. And then you yeah. have this other person that financially supports that to make it happen. But rather than everyone going out to work first thing in the morning, no one taking care of the house, coming back, not having time to make dinner, grabbing a ready meal, and then just, you know, crashing out on the sofa, one person takes care of the other person, which is quite beautiful, really. Yeah. And you've given that a voice. Exactly, exactly. That's the, you've put it in a beautiful kind of frame there. We take care of each other. He, let, he takes care of the larger details to make sure there's a roof over our heads. But I'm the one in that home kind of like the, the finer details, keeping the cogs wearing and the food in the fridge and yummy things on the table and, you know, our pants clean and, you know, like all the spine. Of, and just because I do that doesn't make me less of a person. And I, you know, like less important as well i think we equate status particularly if we think about it in terms of work think about the pandemic like suddenly key workers were seen for what they did you know and we were all outside clapping for key workers and things like that they're the people that keep things running and that's what housewives do that's what mothers do and then i was also up late a few nights ago and i was thinking about do you think, think back to because i know you love this kind of stuff like red tent days Right. So before the world became really commercialized and capitalist and things, we used to live on our own little homesteads, for example. So if you have just birthed a baby, right, you've literally just birthed a baby. Where are you naturally going to want to be? At home. At home. Exactly. So if you if you get into time machine and go back to those those that couple on that little homestead and she's you know perhaps got two or three children already she's just birthed another baby you're not going to go in there and say you know for you to be equal you need to go outside in the field with your husband right now you know like there's we've lost this magic and sense of motherhood like this real magical time motherhood has now become about competition it's become about getting up on your feet as fast as possible to get back to the world and get earning again or get going 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 yet some cultures still actually honor the lying in period and like healing the mother and things like that whereas now in our western culture we are literally kicked out of hospital that very same day if we're able to and uh, you know obviously the nhs is in their interest to do that because they're freeing up a bed but we shouldn't be treating 
birth, women who have just given birth like they are some machine in okay. terms of, yeah. you know, get back to normality. The normality of birth and early motherhood and even motherhood beyond that is something magical and totally different. It changes your perspective. It changes your body. You need to nurture your, your, your body, but also your mind and your spirit. You need to rest. Mm. And I just really, I just hate the idea that we've allowed this culture and this mentality of rat race to take the magic out of that period of time, which we're only going to get. Some of us, unfortunately, never get it. But when we do, it's far too fleeting. And what are you going to look back on? Oh, yeah, I, I, I wanted to get back to work. You know, like, I don't know. It doesn't compute for me. I know women are all different in terms of mm. their mindsets and, you know, if they want a career. But this is one very good reason as to why we will never be equal with men. Because equal means exactly the same. And our ability to birth babies and be mothers and nurture them is different to what men provide. It's both equally important, mm. but the approach is completely different. We are not equal to men and we shouldn't try. We should have equal opportunities and equal, you know, um, equal chances equal access to education equal, equal rights respect and that kind of stuff. i think as yeah. well yeah but i just feel like it, it almost goes back to that podcast you did before about the erasure of women like our role is being stolen from us and we are just being turned into these like autobots we're almost doing it ourselves. i i, heard yeah, the day, I believe like, we are there people talk about this patriarchy but it's not that becoming a matriarchy is just putting women in power it's that we honor mother earth and we honor the mother but i do also i mean everything you were saying makes so much sense i actually talk about this i've started this new course called bump and beyond which is all about pregnancy and postnatal care and i am i can't even tell you i'm so obsessed with this idea of women resting and coming back because if we support the mother we support the future generations and the future of our whole planet like that is huge but also you know, to acknowledge the women that may be trying to get pregnant or may not be able to get pregnant. It's not just in terms of honoring this female role is not just necessarily about giving birth it, because I think we can have these qualities without necessarily being a mother, this nurturing, exactly. this caring, this. It's, yeah. It's a celebration of being a woman and mm. all that that entails. And the fact that being a woman is different from being a man. Yeah. But we just, we just want to see things as so black and white these days, I think. And, and, you know, just, we just want to be the same and we're just not created that way. No, we're not. And I think there is the, these words, magic and beautiful. It is all of that. It is so amazing. And when we rest and I talk a lot of the time about honoring our period as well, you know, like that is a chance to rest. And yet if there's this idea and all these like tampon commercials are like, Oh, Tampax Pearl, let's just shove it in and you can go swimming and you can go diving and you can and do party. gymnastics, which I've never done yes. in my life. <laughs> <laughs> but you can now on your period if you use a tampon. And yeah. it's like, we're just trying to pretend that doesn't exist. Going on the pill where I spoke to someone the other day and she's like, I haven't had a period for nine years. And she was really pleased with that. And I'm like, how have we got to this They're point? They're seen as where inconvenient. We... Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, but... they're totally inconvenient apparently. But to go back to your story, you haven't always, I mean, I say you haven't always been this way. You, you often talk about how you had these dreams of, of uh, being a housewife and home caring and oh, home caring. What's the one for? Uh, home making. Um, home making. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Since you were little, but, but you didn't follow that through, did you initially? I didn't, you feel like, I didn't feel like I was allowed to. And actually this is something, uh, another thing that I've observed is that girls are allowed to be girls until a certain point. Like we are allowed to kind of play make believe, you know, our older kind of I don't know, a career. It's an occupation. So we are most women, most women grow up and will become mothers and homemakers, you know, in some guys, like whether it's part time, whether she's just doing on, you know, when she can on weekends because she has to work. So my mother, for example, um, but we're only allowed to play, in that role and make believe up until we hit puberty. As soon as we hit puberty and become fertile, that's taken away from us. So it's no longer, think about boys, right? They're into football, they're into cars, they're into rough and tumble, you know, 
sports, all that kind of stuff that things classically boys are into, that is never taken from them. They can be into football from the age of four to 84. But for a girl to want to desperately want to be a mother and a homemaker, as soon as she hits puberty at a natural age, so early teen years, rather than what we're seeing these days where it's happening earlier and earlier, if a girl was to be obsessed about the idea of having babies at that age, we would think, oh, panic, panic. Let's take that away from her because suddenly well, society has decided that you're not capable of being a mother until you're, now it's nearer 30. That's the age that most people are saying that's when they want to have babies. But actually we are much more fertile earlier in our years we used to be considered spinsters if you weren't married by the age of 24 it was all over for you so it's not our bodies deciding these things it's a shifting society so i had to put aside the dreams of babies and homemaking and getting married i desperately just wanted to find my one true love which is fine when you're nine years old, you know, like, oh, isn't that lovely? She loves watching Disney movies and all these romantic <laughs> things. But as soon as you're like 13, 14, it's an issue. It's she needs to grow up now and go and liberate herself and explore. And, you know, even now it's like it, men used to be encouraged to sow their oats. Now women are, do you know what I mean? Which kind of, I just don't think we're necessarily emotionally wired that way because of the, the new, newest neurotic behaviors that happen when you I don't know what we're we looking for I think we need to think about this are we looking for status money careers validation that way or do we really want to find our one true love settle down have a family but people will say that's unrealistic to find a one true love there was is I it really? Even because I it used to happen. Thought, oh, Disney is so, it gives you such unrealistic ideas about love. Love isn't perfect. And it, that is true, isn't it? Like marriage isn't. Like, no, it's no, it's, it's not sunset. perfect. And I think, I think we need to set aside the idea of perfection. I say this to the women, you know, that kind of are in my community about the homemaking. Your housework will never be done. Your house will never look perfect. It's the idea of you love it just as it is and you make it work and the same is true of marriage you know like it's never going to be perfect and you're both going to shift and change and challenges are going to arise and no one is absolutely perfect for you you know like you will fall in it's likely you'll fall in love but you need to give each other grace as well you need to recognize but it's i think we've been taught that this is the disposable culture as well. People are becoming disposable. What, in terms of marriage, like you just think... You yeah, just, just oh, and, yeah. you know, I don't like the way they did this. Oh, I'll just find someone else, you know, because the parameters are so loose these days. Whereas, you know, I mean, I don't want to romanticise it, but we used to date with intention years ago, you know, like you didn't just date for fun and swipe left and right just mm -hmm. for a hookup or whatever you would date with intention you would you would consider that person do i want to settle down with this person and have a baby or have children or make a home together even if you don't want kids but now it's just kind of like oh they'll do for now this will do for now we'll throw it away there's no this is why the traditional aspect of life really um appeals to me because you gather things into your home to last a lifetime and you build connections with things and people and build memories together. It's almost like an, a counterculture against this really fast rat race consumer. Consume, 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 and never stop to reflect about what it's doing to your body, what it's doing to your mental health, what it's doing to your connections with other people. We just, we just don't stop. We just don't stop. And that's what I had to do. I had to step out and just stay home because that's what I absolutely wanted more than anything. I was scared to do it, not because of the idea that I wouldn't be bringing in an income. I was scared of what other people were going to say. Because you were working, working, working as a marketing, I can't get my words out today. I'm sorry. <laughs> Probably a bad right. day for a podcast, but um, 
you were working really quite high up in in marketing weren't you yeah in the beauty just... industry which was just yeah com- complete antithesis of what I do now you know like but I just but I followed that path because it that was the most glamorous kind of option you know like I was just I was sold what Cosmopolitan magazine wrote and what Sex and the City were selling to me that would make my life amazing and I would be so happy and fulfilled. And yet it used to sit at my desk and I would just be like, I just, I just really want to be home and have some babies and have this, it's almost like this biological urge I had, you know, like I just recognized that that fast pace was just not doing me good physically or I'm so stressed but I'm really high functioning stress person. It used to manifest in health for me. So I used to deal with some health issues, but I just got on with it because that's what you do. You go to the doctor, they give you a pill. Here we go, you know, get back on the train. So I'm going to ask you before I just, I'm just going to interrupt you on your little, on your little, your big story of sort of transitioning from, from the marketing side of it, because there's something I really want to ask you in this, because I think so many of us listening will be able to relate to that feeling of stress, that feeling of go, go, going and consuming. Even, even myself, I'm listening to this and I, I knew from a kid, I'm similar to you. I knew from a kid, I wanted a a house, a family. That was my absolute priority. I remember even being at uni going, well, if I screw up these exams, it's not the main thing. I, I want, like marriage is going to be my thing. Like I, yeah. just, I just felt it in my bones. And I, I decided that whatever career I had, I'd make sure that it ties in with me being at home for, for my kids. That was like Which my dream. what we're both doing, mm-hmm. essentially, isn't it? You know? But equally, I've almost found like now with work kicking off and sort of building up, it, it is becoming a career and that stress is coming on. How do we do you have any ideas on how you can navigate this sort of having this purpose like you love writing and, and all of that but but then prioritizing your home as well and, and reducing that stress factor how can we tap into our purpose and the like womanly urges of or not even womanly urges that that house housekeeping home rearing yeah okay so home making why do i, I can I only i can only say this from my perspective uh, because you know you can't step into everybody's shoes but the the key the crux of it all is ask yourself if you won the lottery tomorrow would you still be doing what you're doing because that separates it from um a desire to perform because i think we've been indoctrinated to do that you know we're constantly tested at school pitted against one another So would you still do it if you won the lottery tomorrow? So for me, the answer is yes, because I feel a greater purpose about what I'm doing. But I balance that by saying no from time to time. So last year was actually really stressful for me when uh, kind of like I went viral in the news because everyone, literally everyone wanted a piece of me and I was doing like a podcast or a radio interview or some sort of television thing literally like twice three times a day saying the same thing over and over and over again and it reminded me of my time when I was working my health issues returned almost instantly um so this year I've decided I I really have to put it through a filter of is what I'm doing first and foremost going to benefit my family in the long run so or am I doing it because it's feeding the ego or um, some other thing like financially, I'm thinking, oh, that's a nice little, you know, like this, this will be nice for the money. So financially, we've had to learn to live on my husband's income only, because if I stop this tomorrow, or if it dries up or anything like that, it's not going to make a major impact. So it's about priorities. So the first priority is financial, make sure you can live on that one income. And then in terms of that sense of, oh, a career is going to take off here, you've really got to step back and think, do we as a unit need this? Do we need it? If it dried up tomorrow, would it make, make a difference? So in terms of what I do, I would still write my articles and I only write two a month, something like that. You know, I don't go all out. I'm not literally sat in an office all day every day I literally pick up my laptop for like a half an hour and might write a chapter you know in a you know not a chapter a, a, what they call a paragraph mm-hmm. of that particular blog post with it in mind that I feel like this is information people are going to want to read and will honor 
what I'm doing, but be of value to them. So, but it's the exchange of value as well. If I, if I wasn't getting paid for it, would I still do it? And if the answer is no, then do you really need to be doing it? Mm. Do you really need to be doing it? I mean, if it is financially, then, you know, like you really need to be doing it, then you've essentially got a job. You've created a job for yourself. You've, you've, you've kind of circled back to where you were beforehand. Whereas if it's a purpose, that's a, that brings on a whole new different meaning to everything that you're doing. Mm. that's how I feel about it anyway personally in terms of in terms of my circumstances how do you retrain yourself though to because this goes against this whole push of society how how do you retrain yourself you have to become countercultural almost in everything that you do you have to almost get used to the fact that people are going to find you a bit weird you know, and unfortunately, but even in yourself, no, would you not feel like, cause, cause I know I've been ingrained through school is to be successful, be successful, have a career. Like this is, it's been ingrained in society. Yeah. So it's not even a case of what other people think. It would be, what do I think of myself? And I'd almost feel like a failure. If you I have did to redef- give it up. you have to redefine, redefine what you think success is. Oh Yeah. You know, like you have to redefine what you are. For me, success is a good, stable marriage, a happy, healthy child and a home that functions beautifully. That's everything. It's everything. That is everything. Think about it last year with the pandemic, you know, like that suddenly we had to come into those homes and stay in there. Yeah. You know, like for me, some loads of people really struggled with that because they don't know how to be home. They don't know how to run it, how to enjoy it, how to live. We are living to work when we yes. should work to live. You and know? how can they learn? How can, if, if the people are listening and even I'm like, how can I? What do you do? What are the next steps? The, the, the very, uh, I remember when I was working, I would look at the bigger things. So, sorry, I'm having a bad hair day. Um, <laughs> you you would chase the next thing like an upgrade in the car or a bigger house or a a job title or um, a holiday, like the big financial outlays and stuff. So you really have to kind of like close in and be really happy with the small things. Like look at that pie crust. That is a thing of beauty and pie crust. Yeah. Like a pie, making a pie and not burning it, you know, like, and, just being satisfied with the simple things going out in your garden no matter how small it is and picking a few strawberries off a plant that you you put in a pot you know like I didn't have to go to the supermarket for those and and, you know buy them in plastic packaging I've grown those organically they probably taste better than anything you've ever tasted as well and you'll just be like that's the joy in my day Mm. you know or going for a walk with your child hand in hand and them asking you questions that you can easily answer because kids are so curious. So mommy, why is, you know, what, why do clouds have different shapes or, you know, like why does the wind blow or like just really small things like you have to. How are they easy to answer? They are the most tricky questions. (laughs) My son asked me. Did you not do geography at school? (laughs) I didn't pay attention. Did you not pay attention to your sciences? But it's it's so we were in a toy shop yesterday and there was this huge like person like a character in a bear costume and he goes to me mommy why is that bear so big I was like I genuinely don't don't know the art like why is he big why because it's because because he is but you could but you could well I'm <laughs> sorry I, it's a different, cause, I mean you're obviously your child's not at school age yet but my mine is nine this year um it's only going to get worse for questions that I can't answer. Oh, you just, yeah. No, you'll have no time to work, love. <laughs> oh, wait, the worst, questions. the worst was like, we were in London. I was like, we're going to London. And he goes, where is London? I'm like, here, where? No, here, we're in it. Where? Oh, it took like a f- whole five minute conversation for me to answer that question. And even still, I didn't really do it justice. But you have a phone. You could have brought up a map of the UK. and shown but We were in like- London. Yeah. And he was like looking around like, where is it? I'm like, we're in it. This is it. Aww. But his age, he can't comprehend those kind of, you know, 
like he thinks London's an object or something yes, at that age. Exactly. Maybe, it was a maybe. very difficult chat. Sorry. But yeah. But things like the bear, for example, you could say, well, do you think that that's really big for a bear? How big do you think bears should be? You know, and then you could go, if it, we were in a toy shop, you could go to the slice, you know, those little plastic animals. Obviously, they're not, you know, completely to scale, but you could show him comparative a duck and a bear. And you would say, do you think that that person in a bear suit was what it's like in real life? Or do you think it was just a, a little, a bit of pretend or something? You know, like it just opens up conversation mm. and narrative. And I think also this is another absolute luxury of being home all the time is that you can converse with your child, which is, I think, how they learn. Think about it pre school era school only really came about in kind of like the late edwardian early victorian times kids would just be at the feet of their parents learning all day all day learning by example and through conversation some of them couldn't even read but you could learn about the, the world through just conversing and you know when you're a harassed working mother and you get home i know you, you just want to sit down and just go oh and not talk and i and i just think the wonderful thing about being at home is that you can converse with your child and educate them that way rather than be give them the really short answer because you're so exhausted yeah what do you do because yeah what what do you do to entertain your kids because i feel like there's a there's when you say kids would just learn by example learn at the feet of their parents what would they learn because i often think back what did people do before there was technology how did they entertain their Jody, family did you grow up with technology no and i can't remember what i did there were a lot of toilet roll holders that i used to glue onto stuff exactly yeah you just created your own fun i i, I, I remember like. doing a lot of draw i remember playing with my barbies and my barbie dream house a lot that was the ultimate for me because hey <laughs> idol <laughs> um, and I used to draw and I remember spending a lot of time outside unfortunately society has shifted in such a way that kids don't play outside anymore till the yeah. street lights come on you know like I feel really sorry for them there there's a we used to have to wake up really early in the morning to catch the cartoons you know like you couldn't yeah they weren't on demand and I think that all of this te like technology and things is sapping us of our creativity and our happiness because it's all just literally have you seen that movie wally no oh Pixar yes movie? yeah wally. they're just literally just in a chair I call it wally i thought it was yeah. like wally. wally wally i don't know i say wally but they're just in a chair getting really fat and overweight and unhealthy not moving their bodies just in front of a screen like yeah that's the way we're going and we really need to we need to stop it before it's too late. And the only way you can do that, you can't do it on a great grand scale. You can only do it with yourself. And when people ask you why you're so happy, you say, because I live this particular lifestyle. So that's kind of what I'm doing with the Dali Academy. Really, I'm just sharing these smaller moments of like a really mindful, you know, two hours in my day of making a really gorgeous chicken pie sharing that recipe and encouraging people to follow suit rather than sit there and watch love island for two hours which i'm not judging by the way because i do like watching that but do you know what i mean like i balance it it's about a balance yeah yeah everything you're saying is so wise and it's interesting because you recommended a book to me um called oh what was it it was um oh my god uh husbands eating the, the proper, proper feeding, feeding of yeah, husbands. yes, proper care and feeding of husbands. And I read it and it was so triggering initially. It was like, it was basically saying that women are selfish for having careers and not putting their husbands and family first. And like, aren't why, why you shouldn't be surprised that your marriage is falling apart because you're selfish. And I was like, that oh my God. really triggering. <laughs> yeah. I was like, this is so <laughs> unbelievable. I couldn't put it down. And actually, whilst triggering it made a lot of sense and for a couple of weeks of my life I was like dedicated to my house I thought I'm going to put this into practice and I baked cookies and I took them up to Joel when he was working and he was like 
this is amazing. And because he received that care, he cared for me right back and it completely uplifted our marriage. And I was like, there is so much sense to this. So much sense as triggering as it was. And so yeah. I think, I think there is something in it, but then I kind of have slept, slept back, slipped back into those ways of like, no, I want to build up the female health hub and I want to support women. And that's kind of gone. How do you find a balance? You just, yeah, I don't know. I don't know because what you're doing is really helpful. It's re it's really helpful to so many women. You're providing, they would go, they would go to the doctors, for example, and the doctors would push pills at them. Whereas actually you're healing things really holistically and naturally is, you know, how we're supposed to function. We are trying to shoehorn ourselves into this kind of, you know, robotic, technology led synthetic way of life whereas actually you're kind of taking us back really ancient practices in terms of mm. you know rhythms and listening to your body and nourishing it with proper healthy earth-given foods and you know i think what you're doing is really beautiful but don't forget yourself in the process i think this is what women are so we're so we try and please everyone all the time and we do that to the detriment of ourselves. But you sounded like when you were doing that, having that period of just dedicating yourself to your home and your husband and your family, you sounded like you were really happy. And I know we've had private conversations about this where you just like, it just felt wonderful. So what I'd advise women to do is just try it. Mm. Just try it and see where, rather than thinking they're walking into a prison, Think, I'm actually going to try this out and see if I really like it and reevaluate, you know, and the balance is really hard. And unfortunately, Jodie, I don't have the answers. Well, come back so, when you do. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> but are you happy? And do Me? you feel stressed? Yeah. Yes, I'm happy. I, I feel a lot of, uh, see, unfortunately, the pressure to write another book is out there. You know, like I'm kind of like, mm. I probably should because people really want this information. It's like you with the hub. It's like, what's next? I'm going to help women, you know, bump and beyond. You help them get pregnant, but then obviously they, you know, there needs to be this kind of like full package of how you help them. So I feel like, yes, I should write another book, but I'm also really listening to myself and thinking now's not the right time. I don't, Rome wasn't built in a day and I don't need to do everything right now. You know, that's everything. That is the answer, isn't it? That's yeah. the answer. So what but, you were saying, I don't have the answers. I think that's actually it. It's yeah. acknowledging what you want to do, but listening to yourself as to whether it's the right time. Exactly. I mean, I, you know, I wrote the first book in 2016. That was Ladies Like Us. And I wrote that in record time because I was just desperate to get that information out there. I was like, I would sit down and write, you know, 10,000 words in a day. And I'd be like, how did I manage that? Because it was just flowing through me. It was my purpose at the time. The second book came three years later, which is, it's called English Etiquette, but actually it's more about grace and how we interact with our families and our friends and, and kind of the image we put out to the world in terms of our behavior rather than, you know, trying to look posh and all that kind of stuff. It's about, etiquette is about kindness and consideration of other people, but also yourself. But this third book, I'm thinking, do you know what? My son's nine and there's not many years left until he's going to start fledging. Do you know what I mean? Like he's going to start spending less and less time with me. He's probably going to be sleeping all day because teenagers <laughs> sleep a lot. And then when they're up, they want to be out with their mates. And then he'll probably get an apprenticeship or a job. And then sure enough, he'll probably won't, it won't be cool to live with mum and dad anymore and he'll be gone. You know, if we kind of round his age up to 10, we've got kind of like six, seven years left before that starts really, you know, I'm potentially an empty nester. Can I wait six or seven years to write the other book? Who's putting the pressure on me to write that book? It's probably me because I'm feeling people are expecting it of me. I was actually, it might not be the right time. Maybe I've got more to learn before mm. I put that out there. Do you know what I mean? Like, and I'm only 36 this year. Think about it if you have a period. That's when you're most intuitive. Most intuitive, yeah. Yeah, but I'm just not feeling it's the right time, you know? Yeah. So, and I think, I think more of us need to do that. Is this the right time? Is this best for me? Is it best for my family? Or am I doing it because it's an expectation and pressure? Mm. 
I love chatting to you. I'm like aware of the time, but I, I know if we recorded the last one, we went on for hours. So we I, did, I will, we? I will wrap it up. But I did, I think I interrupted you when I was just briefly sort of asking you about your story. So just quickly, could you just sum up the fact that you went from from working, you decide to have a baby, right? And then you you fell into this. Yeah, well, yes. Yeah. So I uh, I dreamt of being a housewife and a mum. And then I went and got a career and was successful in that career. And then I had my baby and suddenly I was at home with the baby and I didn't know who I was anymore. I had a real crisis of confidence about it all and I just had to reevaluate everything I suddenly suddenly had achieved my dream but I wasn't being validated in any way whatsoever I was floundering I think a lot of um I think I had undiagnosed postnatal depression because of actually because all of this stuff that I had built up around myself in terms of my self-identity my role at work and how much money I earned and things like that was just suddenly stripped for me and I was just this being with a baby didn't know what to do because we're not trained are we we go to these antenatal classes and you know how to change a nappy and all that kind of stuff but you don't you know how to do the practical things but you don't know how to step into that role of motherhood you know like because it's not being modeled to us anymore necessarily um and it and it's not represented in the media all we see is women uh, as career women you know go-getters and things so i had this real absolute crisis of confidence and then i mean this is in ladies like us what happened to me but i had to relearn how to love myself in my new identity and i started searching for validation you know like who else is living like this who is saying that this is normal who is saying that this is lovely and it wasn't out there so that's why i created the darling academy which was to honor and love and show these women that they are amazing for being just a housewife and just a mum. I love it. It's so beautiful. And your books are lovely. They really are. So where can people find your books and where can they learn more about the Darling Academy? Yeah, well, you can go to the darlingacademy.com. The books are on there. Um, but you can also just go straight to Amazon. The first one's called Ladies Like Us. And the second book is English Etiquette. Amazing. And where can they find you? Because you're around and they can watch your videos ah, where can they find you yeah it's all on the darling academy.com um i'm also on instagram i'm kind of on there daily that's the fun place to be um and the handle is the darling academy amazing and if people are listening and they're like what can i do because this sounds amazing what is the one thing that you think women can do to just take back their power and connect to this homemaking role love yourself for being a woman and that doesn't have to be this girl power aggressive woman it can be the tender sensitive lady who has these ups and downs through the months in terms of you know not physical or mental but just this sense of like you say intuitive at your period honor your body you know, like, don't try and stress yourself out fitting this modern mold of being this go get a career woman if that's not who you are. You know, like, really listen to your heart and follow it rather than the pressures that are put on you and what you think you should be doing with your life. I love that. It's so beautiful. Thank you so much. Oh, I don't think this was too controversial. I think we can put this up. I think we can do this one. Yeah, we can have the controversial chat at the end of the month when we meet in real life. I'm so excited. Yes, yeah, oh, so Anita and I, we've become such good friends post, well, during lockdown and we haven't yeah. actually met in person. So. We live on the opposite ends of the country. So yeah, it's a bit hard, but uh, we're I'm meeting. so excited. I hope you're not weird in real life. I'm really small though. Oh, well, I'm tall. I'd be like my tiny friend. You told me that I'm going to smell of patchouli. <laughs> <laughs> you said I was going to smell like old ladies. <laughs> well, you love all the vintage stuff. <laughs> I do. It doesn't mean I smell vintage. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You know when sometimes you walk into like vintage shops and it just smells like mould? Musty. Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah, that's the word. Okay. Yeah. I mean, no, it doesn't I'm smell like that. No, my, I'm a very good housekeeper. It smells fresh. <laughs> I'm so excited. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye.